typically develops after an infection with a streptococcus, also termed as streptococcus pelagenes. And um, this infection caused by both a strep is usually a strep throat, a sore throat, or a scarlet fever, which is a red skin infection. No rheumatic fever can affect the heart, the joints, the skin, as well as the brain. There's no lab test, there's no individual, there's no single, or there isn't even any group of lab tests that can identify or um, that can identify um, acute rheumatic fever. However, we use the lab tests that we're going to be discussing along with the um, modified Jones criteria in order to determine whether or not the patient does have an acute rheumatic fever. So the laboratory tests in this case will aid, the only aid in the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever. So in the lab, we're going to be culturing, meaning that we're trying to be, we're going to try to be isolating, we're trying to, going to try to pull up the group A streptococcus, and so that we can provide evidence of recent infection with group A strep. Um, so you know, we're going to be either taking a, a, a blood swab, or if it's a case of a patient with a skin infection, we take a swab of the infected area, the affected area. In the case of a throat swab, of course, you're going to swab your patient's throat, the tonsils, and you're going to try as much as possible not to contaminate that swab with too many areas of the mouth. The mouth contains a lot of normal blood. When I say normal blood, I'm not sure that there's no normal surface. So you don't find the answer, but you're not interested in the answer, you're interested in the ones. And that particular one, in this case, will be a strip, which would be causing your patient's um, illness, would be causing your patient's illness. So you're gonna swab the throat in the area of the tonsils, whilst avoiding as much as possible all the areas, all the other areas of the mouth. You don't want to get too much normal flora. And then you're gonna place that swab into your Stuart's transport media. And this is our Stuart's transport media here. Um, it's made up in our laboratory, so it's in-house Stuart's transport media. You can also obtain commercial Stuart's transport media. But Stuart's transport media is your ideal transport media. You'll hear spoken about very frequently in the bacteriology. It is your ideal transport medium for um, preserving your organisms, bacterial organisms. So it maintains the organisms in a non in a viable state, pardon me, without causing too much replication, without allowing them to replicate too much so that when they do get to the lab, they are still viable, but they wouldn't have overgrown the media. And of course, when you collect your patient's swab, you collect your patient's sample, place it into the Stuart's transport media. The swab would have been, you know, it's a wooden swab, so you're gonna break the shaft, cover it, and ensure that it is sealed properly. And what I cannot overemphasize, I cannot tell you it too many times, the importance of labeling, of ensuring that the sample is properly labeled. So you see there in your patient's name, the registration will be a great help, the ward that the patient is coming from, is it A and E, is it outpatient, as well as the type of specimen that you have collected. What will also be important is the date when the sample was collected. So it's very important that you properly label your samples. So when the throat swab gets to the laboratory, we're going to examine the, the bio there, the Schwartz transport media, and of course you would have sent your requisition form. So we're going to ensure that what's on your requisition form matches what is on your, your sample there. And then from there, when everything there checks out, from there we're going to inoculate blood agar. We inoculate other types of media as well, but what is most important for your purposes is your blood agar. Your blood agar. So we're going to inoculate your blood agar, and then we're going to incubate your blood agar, and we're going to be observing after incubation for any beta hemolysis. Now this is what beta hemolysis looks like. Um, do you know all the different types of hemolysis, different patterns of hemolysis? Very good, beta, alpha, and gamma. So of course, beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis. Alpha will be incomplete or partial, whereas gamma will be no hemolysis. Now these colonies here are showing you beta hemolysis. So for example here, this is one colony right here, that white spot in the middle there. And can you see a clearing around that colony? That is beta hemolysis. So the red cells surrounding the colony has been completely, the red cells have been completely um, hemolyzed, and so there's no more coloration in the media. So it, if you were to hold that plate up to the light, the light would just completely shine through. All right, so that's beta hemolysis. So we find that we have beta hemolysis, and as a matter of fact, right
this thing do I look in as a complete overgrowing of the normal Florida with just the group or with just these eight that humanity coming is right now. What we're going to do is that we're going to subculture, meaning that we're going to take one or two of these colonies and then we're going to inoculate that onto a second blood agar. And in addition to that, we're going to add in acid tracing this to the center of the pool, like this. All right. So we incubate overnight, 18 to 24 hours incubation, and then we observe. Now, what you're observing here are your beta humanity colonies, which we expect. But in addition to that, you are observing a zone of inhibition around your classic tracing dips. And this is indicating to you that the classic tracing which would have been fused into the agar is inhibiting the growth of the organism as it approaches the classic tracing dips. So we have this zone of inhibition here. You notice that um, this, this zone surrounding the classic tracing dips, there's no hemolysis here because colonies did not go right into the passage tracing this. Okay? But these colonies are susceptible or they are sensitive to the passage tracing this. And this is the, the confirmatory test for group A streptococci. Right? Group A streptococci are susceptible to passage tracing. That, that's very important. Data humanity group A streptococci are susceptible or they are sensitive to passage tracing. Right? And that's also the same as streptococcus pyogenes. So we identified that the patient had a group A strep infection. There are other laboratory tests that we can perform. For example, there's an anti streptolysing O antibody test, and it is called the ASAT test, or you need to refer to it as the ASTO test. Now, what we want to do here is detect antibodies to streptolysing O. So, group A streptococcus, when it infects a patient, um, it has a lot of um, various factors. Streptolysing O is one of them. And streptolysing O actually lyses the red cells. It causes a lot of, makes a lot of havoc, then it causes infection. So if your group A streptococcus put, um, produces streptolysing O, then it means that you would mount an immune response to streptolysing O. So it means that the patient should have antibodies to streptolysing O. So we want to detect these antibodies in the patient's serum. So the ASOT or the ASTO test is also referred to as a neutralization test. It's a neutralization test and it's also referred to as a hemolysis test. The end point is hemolysis or one possible end point is hemolysis. So that's why we determine it as a hemolysis test. So we want to detect the ability of your streptolysing O or reduced streptolysing O to act as a hemolysing and lyse red cell. No. We're not detecting the streptolysing O in the patient sample. We're detecting the antibodies to the streptolysing O. So it means that at some point during the test, we add streptolysing O. But I'll talk about this. So it means that the red cells then serve as an indicator of whether or not we were able to detect the antibodies to the streptolysing O. All right? Um, in the absence of anti-streptolysing O antibodies, streptolysing O is able to very small sample because we typically perform these tests in um, microtitro plates. So very small volume. Uh, we're going to add streptolysing O to that. If antibodies to streptolysing O are in the patient sample, they find the streptolysing O so that when we subsequently add red cells, the streptolysing O is bound up or it's been neutralized by the antibodies from the patient serum sample so that they're not able to hemolyze the red cells. However, if there were no antibodies in your patient's um, serum sample, when we add streptolysing O to your patient sample, there's no antibody there to neutralize except your streptolysing O so that when we add our indicator, the red cells, the red cells are going to be hemolyzed by the streptolysing O. We're going to discuss that soon. So we prepared various dilutions of the patient's serum sample. And as I said, it's a microtitial plate. Do we know what a microtitial plate looks like? Nobody knows what a microtitial plate looks like? It's a, a, it's, a, it's a fat plate about the size of my hand. And it has wells running down. We have a column of wells. And when all of these, it goes up to 12, um, 12 columns of wells, 
and then so that equals to um, from A through to H rows, all right? So that's about eight rows running right across. So they're very small wells, so it's like I said, it's about the size of my hand, so these are very small um, volumes of samples. But I have a photo later on, so I'll show you that, all right? So we prepare various dilutions of a patient serum sample, and then we add what is sent to us commercially. So we're gonna add a commercial preparation of streptolysin O. Now then tell me, if we're gonna incubate as well, at this point, if antibodies to streptolysin O are present in your patient's sample, and we add streptolysin O, what do you expect to happen? You won't be able to visually see anything, but what do you expect to happen in the world? Antibodies should bind antigen, right? So your antibodies in your patient serum sample are going to bind the destructalizing in O. You won't be able to visualize that. You won't be able to see that macroscopically, even microscopically, which is why we use the red cells as an indicator system so we can see what's happening. At this point, if antibodies to your streptolysin O are indeed present in your patient sample, they can be streptolysin O. So then, after incubation, we're going to add now a constant volume of red cells. So we're going to add a standard volume of red cells to each well, to each dilution. Again, we're going to incubate, we're going to re-incubate at this point. However, if the antibodies were indeed present in your patient sample, and they bound that streptolysin O. Remember, your streptolysin O is supposed to lyse your red cells. If your streptolysin O has been bound up or been neutralized by the antibodies, can this streptolysin O now lyse the red cells? No, they cannot. And so what will happen is that the, the red cells will simply fall to the bottom of the well and they form what is termed as a body. However, if there were no antibodies to streptolysin O in your patient's serum sample, you know, antibodies, we add streptolysin O, so there are no antibodies now, no complementary antibodies to bind or to neutralize your streptolysin O, means that streptolysin O remains free in the serum, doesn't it? Does it? You following me? If you're not following me, you can ask me, you know, you can ask me to explain. Not following. All right, let me go through, and then if you don't get it, we go again. So we're saying that there are no antibodies to streptolysin O in your patient's serum sample. Where would the antibodies to streptolysin O come from in the first place? How would they have been found in your patient sample? Because your patient would have had an infection which group A streptococcus. Group A streptococcus would have produced that streptolysin O your body would have detected that as foreign, mounted an immune response, and produced antibodies to that streptolysin O. So the antibodies to streptolysin O would have been a result of your having an infection. All together? Good. Now, as I'm saying now, if there are no antibodies to streptolysin O in your patient's serum sample, why would that be? Because the patient didn't have an infection with group A strep. Excellent. So there are no antibodies. We don't know. The patient turned up ill. They had a, a, a sore throat, but we don't know what was wrong with them. We're testing them to see what's happening. So we obtain their serum, make up the dilutions, add streptolysin O to that, but there are no antibodies. So I'm giving a sneak peek into the patient samples. No antibody to streptolysin O. So streptolysin O remains free. When I do add red cells, what's going to happen to that red cell? Excellent. The streptolysin O remains free and is able to lyse the red cells. And so the end point then is going to be lysis or hemolysis. So the end point then of a negative test is going to be hemolysis and the end point of a positive test is going to be bony or no lysis. Go ahead. We're not doing it twice. I just explained the two scenarios. dilutions of your patient serum sample. We added streptolysin O to check to see if antibodies to streptolysin O are present. What I explained was the two possible scenarios. 
antibodies may be present. Antibody, antibodies may not be present. So I just went into two different scenarios. We're not doing it twice. Streptococcus O is an antigen. I didn't hear the last one. Right, streptococcus group A. All together? Any questions? So we're going to go through a few tests. Right. So let's go, let's go through again. All right. So let's go again. Let, let, me, let me show you this. This is an example of the microtype of faith that I'm telling you about. See that? So we have a series of wells that we can test multiple patients at the, at the same time. We can also do our controls. So what you're seeing there, positive and negative, those are our controls. And T1 through to T6, those are patient samples. So this is my microtype of faith here. I make up various dilutions of my patient serum sample. So let's just take this first row here and make up various dilutions. So I start off with a dilution of one in 40, one in 60, one in 80, one in 160, all the way down to 2400. All together? So we made up those dilutions of the patient serum sample. We want to determine if antibodies to streptolysis O are present. All together? Talk to me, you know. I prefer to hear you rather than to wonder if you're getting it. So your patient turned up with a strep throat, and we want to find out what they had turned up with a sore throat, pardon me, and we want to find out what's happening. We want to find out if their astrotest is positive. We want to find out if antibodies to streptolysis O are present in their serum sample. And this would indicate that they had a streptococcus group A infection. Good. I then add a standard amount of streptolysis O to each well, each dilution, and I incubate. This incubation is to allow antibody in a patient serum sample, if it is there, 